The Girl Who Lived Again, Part 1 of 2, a Harry Potter fanfiction, written by E.J. Lomax, on archive of our own, as Dirge Without Music, read by Grant Goodwin. Hermione went to the library when Harry first confided in her. Whatever the faculty, the administration, or the ministry believed or didn't believe, the Hogwarts library gave the children what they needed, and always would. Hermione came back with books and books on gender and wizarding history, on the spells and words wizards had used for centuries or decades or mere years, and she and Harry bent their heads together and figured out what words Harry felt best told her story. From her hometown library, after that first summer, Hermione brought back memoirs and brightly coloured pamphlets that Harry read through instead of finishing her potions homework. When Harry looked in the mirror of Erised, she still saw her mother, her father, all her gathered, lost kin. The spectre of her father gathered up her hands in his. Her mother pushed back the long dark hair Petunia had always made her cut short, and she called her beautiful. When she looked into it again, after Devil's snare and winged keys, giant chess and Ron lying prone on the floor, Hermione wringing her eleven-year-old hands in the potion riddle room, when Harry looked into the mirror again, she saw herself, just herself. The girl in the mirror winked and smiled, and slipped the stone in Harry's pocket. No matter what other wishes and want laid on her narrow shoulders, at the end of the day, the thing Harry wanted most was to help. Harry brushed one hand over the lump of rock in her robe pocket, and then brushed her other over her mess of hair, which was feet shorter than the girl in the mirrors. She woke up in the hospital wing, bedside table piled high with candy. Once Harry and Hermione had sussed out between them what the words were for, what was going on here, they had explained it to Ron. Harry didn't come out to anyone else until partway through second year, though, at the height of the air of Slytherin nonsense. She was fed up then. She just wanted to be left alone, and this wouldn't help with that. But they were all already staring. Keeping this to herself felt like a vice around her chest. Hogwarts was supposed to be better. After, Ron came almost to blows with anyone who goggled or sniffed or rolled their eyes. Seamus learned to swallow his tongue. Draco Malfoy didn't. Hermione wrote up an explanatory note about appropriate pronouns in her best penmanship, and then copied it with flicks of her wand. With Harry's embarrassed permission, she gave it to every professor Harry had, or would ever have. Colin Creevy stopped her in the great hall with a tug on her sleeve. She turned, shoulders rising, and the kid said in his piping voice, You're still my hero. That was better than it could have been, but she wasn't sure she liked the still. Peeves? though he was nasty about everything else, ickle firsties and orphan girls, got it immediately. For all six years of her Hogwarts tenure, he dropped water balloons on the heads of anyone who misgendered her. Professor Binns never quite figured it out, but he didn't know any student's name. Nearly Headless Nick gallantly and somewhat awkwardly called her lady, and tried to hold open doors for her, despite the fact that he couldn't open them. Snape called Harry Mr. Potter for all seven years that he was in Harry's life. Around year three, Ron stopped counting the detentions he got for his increasingly sarcastic responses to this. The whispers about the air of Slytherin grew louder and louder, keeping pace with, Ah, uh, I thought it was the boy who lived? Fred and George Weasley took it upon themselves to walk Harry to and from class when they could, talking loudly enough to drown everything out. Then Hermione got petrified, and the air whispers stopped abruptly. Harry? If she hadn't been busy with Ron trading off reading their assigned textbooks aloud to Hermione in the infirmary, might have felt gratified that the whole school knew how much this bushy-haired kid meant to her. All right, so they thought she might murder Muggleborns with a mysterious monster, or sick a snake on her opponent in a dueling club, but they knew she wouldn't hurt Hermione for anything. In the chamber, she met Tom Riddle. He was supposed to be her mirror, though she didn't quite know that yet. He was supposed to be her shadow the chain around her ankle, the other half, or another eighth, of her story and his soul. Ginny had been trying to speak for months, to tell someone, to open the diary in the bag under her bed full of chicken blood-stained robes, and to thrust them into the light. But Percy had shushed her, all his assumptions orbiting his own importance to her story. The teachers had patted her on the head. She had been frightened, eleven years old, with Tom whispering in her ear, guiding her hands. Harry had been trying to speak for years, to explain to someone the way she did not feel like Dudley, like Vernon, 
like the boys in the locker room at school. Hermione had listened. Hermione had given her books and books of people who felt like her. Ron had listened and taught her wizard's chess and kicked Draco in the shins. But here Harry was, standing alone, a red-head lump at her feet, dark robes sodden with mouldy water. Hermione was frozen, Ron was trapped behind a rockfall, and Tom was pacing, gloating, glowing. Ginny was breathing. Ginny had to be breathing. Harry was going to save her. She had to, because no one had listened to the kid, not even Harry. The phoenix tears left no scars on Harry's arm. Riddle, the chamber, the life going out of her, everything that had happened in that long year, none of it left scars on Ginny, or at least none that anyone could see. When Harry got back to Four Privet Drive that summer, she suffered through Aunt Petunia's annual haircut, and then she curled up with Hedwig and wrote a letter. She wrote about the muggle candies she missed when at Hogwarts, and how her cousin thought she was weird for being excited about summer homework. She asked Ginny how she was. Ginny wrote back after a long week. She didn't answer the question, but she wrote about helping Dad on the car, about the apple harvest coming, and Fred and George playing pranks on the ghoul in the attic. When Dementors glided in rustles and chill quiet onto the Hogwarts Express in the beginning of her third year, Harry went down. She heard her mother scream, her father shout, and Tom Riddle laugh, high and terrible. Madame Pomfrey had grown back her bones after Dobby's bludgeoning bludger and Lockhart's terrible attempt to help. She'd patched Harry up after the third floor passage in her first year, after the chamber in the second, after the Dementors this year, tutting sternly behind her teeth. After stuffing her full of chocolate, she pulled Harry into her office at the beginning of that third year and said, You'll need signed permission from your guardian, but if you're interested in undergoing magically aided transition, that's something this infirmary is capable of. But my aunt and uncle, there... Harry started miserably. She had already had this fight with McGonagall about Hogsmeade. They're muggles, she said, but that didn't explain anything here. I'm sorry, said Madame Pomfrey, and she sounded like she was but there are restrictions. She sighed and brushed a hand over the white kerchief tied over her hair. I'm sorry, Harry. You do go by Harry, right? Yeah, she said. That's fine. Harry, she said. Is it all right if I give your contact information to some of the other trans students in the school? There's been a sort of unofficial mentorship program between the years, and some of them have asked about approaching you. Uh, said Harry. Um, yeah. Madame Pomfrey made a little note on her clipboard. Harry had thought about changing her name, to Lily maybe, but she liked the way Harry sounded, shouted across Quidditch pitches, hissed by Ron outside her barred window in a flying car, freckled and grinning wide. The name her parents had given her. It was hers. Very little was hers. Hedwig, a locked bank vault she'd happily trade for two living parents. But this was... Weird little Potter, Draco said loudly from Slytherin table, after. Girly, after all, fainting like that. You know, said Fred, leaning in close to Harry. Draco came running, crying into our compartment, after. Harry snickered into her mashed potatoes. Lupin had gotten a letter in Hermione's certain hand about Harry's proper pronouns, just like every teacher in Hogwarts had. When Harry came to him for help with the Dementors, Lupin fetched a bogart and taught her about Patronuses. He also stopped her one day, and handed her a scrap of paper. These are the addresses of some friends of mine, Lupin said. They're like you. If you want to send them some letters, by owl post, I'm sure they'd be happy to write back. The Patronus was hard, not because Harry didn't have happy memories buried in her, but because this was the only chance she had ever had to hear her mother and her father. Even in fear, even in their last gasped desperations, she wanted to know them but she couldn't let anyone take Quidditch from her, so she thought about flying. She squeezed her eyes tight, but it wasn't quite the right kind of happiness, so she woke up on Lupin's office floor, and he gave her some chocolate. Sometimes Ron wasn't there to snap at hissed taunts. Sometimes Harry didn't feel like snapping back her own self, as sharp and vicious as she knew how to be. Sometimes she wanted empty spaces, and so she'd grab the invisibility cloak and just go, climbing up towers, counting cobwebs, sitting unseen at the feet of suits of armour, and imagining ancient old battles. One chill afternoon in her third year, she grabbed the cloak and went out to the grounds, 
She thought about going to Hagrid's for tea, or taking a nap in his overgrown pumpkin patch, but her feet turned her towards the greenhouses. The door to the non-dangerous greenhouses was not locked. It creaked open under Harry's hand. Inside, the glass walls dripped with condensation, the ground steaming, the air enfolding. It had been brisk outside, but Harry felt her shoulders relax into the warm. She shut the door behind her, and then froze. I know you're there, sweetheart, said a round, bright voice. Despite its robust cheer, the voice did not shatter the peace, so much as fill it, like it was just an extension of the sunlight streaming through the glass. Harry squeezed the cloak more tightly around her, turning. Professor Sprout had been working quietly at a bench, filling ceramic pots with rich soil, drainage and cuttings. She looked up, smiling at the rustle of fabric, and Harry let her hood fall back. Sorry, I... Little Miss Potter, said Sprout, her smile not flickering. Want to do some potting? She chuckled to herself. So Harry folded up the cloak and sat on the rickety bench beside her. Sprout told her about root systems, how they can be deep, or wide and shallow, or thick and hoary, breaking stones over years and years. She told Harry about moulds and aphids, about trellising and types of soil. When Harry wanted peace, sometimes she grabbed her cloak and walked, unseen, wherever she wanted. Sometimes she came here. Sprout talked, a bubbling little chatter that touched every leaf and sprout in the space. She also listened. Her hands streaked with dirt and green juices from careful cuttings. Harry told Sprout, haltingly, that she felt unnatural, strange, terrible. Do you really? said Professor Sprout. Or is it just the things that other people say? She pulled a trowel gently from Harry's sticky hands and set it on the table. She pushed Harry's growing bangs out of her eyes, her mother's eyes, they said. Because you, my dear, are natural. She touched Harry's nose and left a streak of dirt on it. Sprout said, This nose? All skin and blood and cartilage, just like any other nose. This hair? Did you know it's all dead hair? Sprout patted her own voluminous bush of grey hair. Fingernails, too. Do you know about shelled creatures? Have you been to the sea? But all those shells, one shell, two shells, they build them out of themselves, those old, dead, lovely things. The heart is alive, the flesh, but they build themselves homes to carry on their backs. She scrubbed at her cheek, leaving her own streak of dirt. I think I got distracted. Dead things? offered Harry. Oh, said Sprout. Yes, I have it. She leaned forward, smiling with her big cloud of hair, her thick nose, her rumpled, rolled-up robes. You're perfect. Ignore the rest of them. When Madame Pomfrey's unofficial mentorship program contacted Harry, she didn't immediately recognize it. She stiffened, she kept her fork firmly in her hand, and she eyed Blaise Zabini warily. He smiled at her and said, Could I join you? This isn't your table, Ron said, glancing over from his chess game with Dean down the table. Madame Pomfrey sent me, Blaise continued, still smiling. Harry blinked and looked at him more curiously. Harry, you good? Ron called. Yeah, Harry said slowly. Blaze sat down, poured himself some tea, and grabbed a piece of toast. Harry kept gripping her fork, watching him closely. You already don't like me, don't you? Blaze said, stirring his tea with a small spoon he must have brought himself. I haven't had the best experience with Slytherins. What do you know about Slytherin? Blaze asked. Harry considered him, his slight smug smile, his perfect hair, his perfectly casual shoulders. Blaze was a teenager his legs a little too long, and his acne as spelled away as he could manage. Harry shrugged and said, Voldemort killed my parents. Yesterday Malfoy tripped Ron and he fell in a hedge. Ah, Draco, said Blaze. You know, last week Pansy conjured a bee into the common room because he'd said something about her nose, and the poor lad shrieked and ran like a girl. Hey, said Harry, I'm a girl. Like a Draco, then, said Blaze, and Harry grinned. The twins gifted her with the marauder's map. She had two unsigned permission slips in her pockets, and they could help with one of them. She snuck out to visit the candy shop and the three broomsticks, and Ron and Hermione, once with Blaze, who spent the whole time explaining old wizard family's rules of comportment. When Blaze figured out she didn't know the first things about makeup, hair, or other skills, of course, he said, I should have known. Who would teach you? 
That Granger girl? Careful, Blaze. Or Muggles? He shuddered. I'll let that pass, but only because it's Aunt Petunia, said Harry. When Blaze learned that, he dragged her up to a fancy Slytherin prefect's bathroom. You're not a prefect. So? With a bag full of supplies. I know all of this, he said. How? said Harry. Blaze smiled. My mother is quite the lady, he said. She's caught four husbands, and she was ready for me to continue the family business of collecting inheritances. Did she take it well? You turning out to be a boy? Oh, there are plenty of rich heiresses about too, present company included, of course, Blaze winked. And knowing how to primp a lady is as useful in being one as in catching one. If you can talk a good talk about contouring, and walk a good walk about bra sizings, well, you make a lot of friends. He waggled his eyebrows. You're not my type, Blaze. I don't curse and spit enough, do I? You want a sailor, I can tell. You'll wrestle in meadows instead of picnicking, and have romantic dates all painted up and hollering at Quidditch matches. Ugh, I can see it now. Matching tattoos, home improvements done by hand, the sort of dog that slobbers on things. Maybe a goose. A goose, said Harry. Excellent watchdogs. Unfriendly, loyal, a little smelly. Harry had a watchdog that year, though she didn't know it. Sirius was there to see how James and Lily's child was. He was also there for Peter. That was the choice, wasn't it? Was he here to watch the living, or avenge the dead, or to avenge himself? In the shrieking shack, Ron went pale with pain on the bed, and Hermione flushed with upset. Harry stepped between her father's best friends and his worst betrayer. In any world, she warned them to be better than this, and for her, they were. But it was not fair. It never had been fair. They did the right thing, and still the moon rose. They let Peter live, and so he turned and ran, taking Sirius's alibi with him. The Dementors swarmed. Harry tried to think happy thoughts, about warm future homes she now wouldn't be able to have, about winning the Quidditch House Cup, about Christmas morning, the first time there had been presents, real presents for her, and the world went black anyway. But sometimes you get second chances. Hours later, or at the same moment, depending on your frame of reference, Harry stood on the edge of a freezing lake and watched herself begin to die on the other side. She was the only one who could do this, and so she did. She thought about the thick heat of the greenhouses and the way the plants breathed. She remembered chess with Ron and full plates around the battered kitchen table of the burrow, and Hermione poring over books, trying to find the words Harry needed. White burst from her wand. They set two innocent souls free that night, and Harry went home to the Dursleys. When Sirius looked at her, he would still see James. He tried to see Lily, and when Harry smirked just so, he could. Those were her eyes, after all, and her heart. He called his goddaughter Harry. To their train home from school that year, Sirius sent a small, unnamed owl. It carried a letter and two permission slips signed by Harry's legal wizarding guardian, one for Hogsmeade and one for Madame Pomfrey. Harry wrote letters all summer, to Sirius with his bright plumaged messengers, to Ginny about Quidditch, about Dudley getting stupider, about whatever muggle artifact, a ballpoint pen, a push lawn mower, a calculator, Arthur had brought home from work that week and to Lupin's friends. One of his friends wrote so academically she had to get Hermione to help her translate. Another used terribly foul language that Harry stored away for future need. The last reminded her of Molly Weasley, quite a lot, up to the worrying, but was much better at understanding what was going on. Molly tried her best. When Harry had told them, Arthur had asked excitedly, Is this a muggle thing? And Hermione had hurried out a no and a frantic history of gender diversity in the wizarding world. It's just that I'm a girl, Harry had said, and Arthur had nodded, and asked her about how telephone booths worked. He would call her by the right pronouns until the day he died, at the respectable old age of 133, and he would make it seem easy. But Molly had to try. Hermione explained things faster and higher pitched every time Molly messed up a pronoun, which was often. Molly frowned and muttered and put extra potatoes on Harry's plate at breakfast. Harry slept on Ron's floor at the burrow, which didn't bother either of them, but which made Hermione scowl and scowl. Harry got boxes of sweets and holiday presents and warm hugs as Molly chewed things over. For her fifteenth Christmas, the Weasley sweater she would receive would be a bright, friendly, 
terrible pink. The next time Harry visited the Weasleys for the Quidditch World Cup, Molly put her on Ginny's floor with Hermione to sleep, for some definition of sleep that involved Hermione hissing threats at three in the morning if Harry and Ginny didn't shut up about Ronsky faints. Do you know what time it is? Next time, Hermione muttered heatedly at breakfast, staring down into a steaming mug of tea. I'm sleeping in Ron's room, or Bill's, or outside with the gnomes. She didn't. Molly dug up a pair of earmuffs from the attic for her, and Harry scooted close to Ginny's narrow cot, crossing her arms on the edge of the mattress, cheek on her bicep. They whispered until morning. Crumbs dive. But the Irish chases, Harry. Did you see that no-look pass? Death Eaters had come marching through the cup, but they would both, even now, especially now, rather talk about Quidditch. Harry rubbed her forehead. Ginny rubbed her writing hand, massaged the callous dent that her quill had left on her middle finger. Harry had been letting her hair grow out. When she went home for summer, Petunia had always made her cut it. The summer after first year, the second. That summer, after her third year, her limbs strung out and shaking, Petunia had gotten out the scissors and Harry had said no. She'd been saying no for years, but this time her hand had flexed on her wand. Petunia's eyes had dropped to the terrible little rod of wood and phoenix feather. I won't let you, she'd said. She hadn't been sure she was bluffing, and neither had her aunt. Harry's head grew heavier, dark curls forming softly around her ears, then framing her stubborn chin. When her name came out of the goblet of fire, she wanted to hide behind the short, dark curtain of it but instead she let herself be pushed to her feet and to the antechamber in the back with the other champions. When Hagrid showed her the dragons in the forest, the first task, she went to tell Cedric. In games, she believed in fair play. In life, less so, but that was more because of experience than ideals. Thanks, man, Cedric said, warm and bright, and then flushed. I call girls man too. Um, sorry. Thanks, ma'am? Just Harry, said Harry. See you on the field. She braided her growing hair back into a little horsetail to keep it out of her eyes when she played Quidditch or evaded dragons while robbing them of golden eggs. Pavati taught her how to braid that fourth year, cross-legged on the couches in the common room. Harry wondered if her mother would have taught her. She wondered if her parents would have cut her hair short and boyish every summer. They had died for her, or did they die for a son? Would they have died for her if they knew? She paged through the picture album Hagrid had made for her, out on her invisible afternoons curled up behind the greenhouses. She looked at their smiling faces. She wondered what they would have called her. When they visited Padfoot out in the cave by Hogsmeade, Ron asked him about eating rats, and Hermione elbowed Ron sternly. And then Harry wet her lips and squeezed her hands, and asked about her parents. What about them? said Sirius. Would they have... Her hair was long now, and she let it fall forward into her eyes, cover her face. Would they have been good about all of this? Sirius knelt down in front of her, taking her hands. Hey, he said, gruff and upset, so young still, though she wouldn't realize that this man kneeling in the rock dirt was young still, even now, until after he was dead. Hey, he said, they loved you so much. That doesn't mean they'd have understood, she whispered. Yeah, it does, he said. Harry, hey, it means they would have tried. They'd have believed you, and if they didn't get it, they would have learned how. She lifted his hand, and she let him push her hair back behind her ear. Would Mom have braided my hair, you think? she said. Sirius shook his head and said hurriedly, when her face fell, No, James. James would have. He did Lily's hair, whenever they both had time, since the first month they started dating. He got good, too. Harry laughed, a little wetly. Sirius smiled and it was a little damp too. He'd have braided your hair and taken you flying and spoiled you rotten with presents, if Mooney and I didn't spoil you first, and Lily didn't stop the lot of us. Lily would have taught you how to make her famous ginger cookies, and to throw a punch, and how to curse like a real lady. Yeah, said Harry. Yeah, he said. Harry had slept in the boys' dormitory her first three and a half years. On a whim, Hermione snuck her up into the girls' dormitory before the Yule Ball to get ready with the other girls, and the tower let Harry in without a murmur of disagreement. Pravati turned Harry down for the ball. I'm straight, she said, very apologetically, and Harry stared and then beamed. Pravati blinked, then grinned back, 
and invited her to procrastinate on her homework with her and Lavender by painting their nails. Lav got this fancy stuff that means the designs will move. Padma Patil, much less straight, took Harry up on the offer, but Harry ended up leaving the ball early to go help Lav and Pavati and Hermione move all her stuff from the boys' dorm to the girls' dorm. She slept on a pad of blankets on the floor. Like a sleepover, said Hermione. A what? said Pravati. It's a muggle thing, said Hermione, but I never went to any back at my muggle school. I just heard about them. McGonagall, who got tattled too a week later, told them to move Harry back to her old dorm. They didn't, which McGonagall found out another week later. She sternly supervised as they moved Harry's things back to the boys' dorm. There are rules, Miss Potter, Miss Granger, Miss Patil, Miss Brown. Another week later, they had returned all Harry's things to the girls' dorms that very night. This continued. The Triwizard Cup continued too. Draco's badges called Harry names that made her want to shrink. Rita Skeeter's pen scrawled out coy little concerns about her. Only Skeeter wrote him. Hermione fumed, reading it at breakfast, spitting mad. Harry picked at her eggs. She went out that afternoon and watered plants in the hot, close air of the greenhouses. A friendly little creeping tendril wrapped around her shin, blooming five-petaled little bursts of pink and white, and Harry tried to pretend this was the most important thing in her life. No hedge mazes, no ugly articles, just roots sunk deep, just the way this little thing turned its leaves towards the light. She dragged Blaze along to tea at Hagrid's. You teach me about eyeliner, I'll teach you about being nice. This dog slobbers, said Blaze. Yes, said Harry. Now pet him and tell him he's a good boy, aren't you, Fang? The third task came. Harry knew her curses, her expelliarmus and her lumos. She knew how to duck and how to run. She heard Fleur scream. She saw Crum moving stiff, unnatural, controlled. She answered the Sphinx's riddle and made it to the centre of the maze. She had thought this was a game. They called her names. They wrote nasty articles and flashed ugly badges in her face. But this part, on the field, the challenges and the competition, she thought this was a game. She was used to life being unfair, a cupboard under the stairs, serious a fugitive when he could have been her home instead, the way people hissed mud-blooded Hermione. She knew about unfairness, but this wasn't supposed to be like that. That was a lie. She knew unfairness on the playing field too. Life had a way of sneaking into her games. Dementors on the Quidditch pitch in the match against Hufflepuff, or Dobby's demented bludger the year before, and her precious broom shattered to splinters. When she'd gone into the lake, she would have saved all four of them if she had to. It was a game, but the water was cold, the light green. They had looked dead, floating there, and she had made sure they all made it back to shore. And so, at the end of it all, she stood there by the cup with Cedric, and they both tried to make a game fair that never had been. Harry had been growing things in the greenhouses for years now, under the tutelage of Cedric's own head of house. The house of loyalty, of fair play, of tolerance. Harry wanted to be brave, to be clever, to be wise, but she wished she could be fair. They reached out together, debts paid, favours returned. The hedge maze flickered out and the graveyard rushed into view. Tom Riddle had thought he had chosen an equal, a half-blood boy, powerful, dark-haired, prophesized, the child of the thrice-defiant. But Harry stood there with wisps of that same dark hair escaping her braid, angry tears on her cheeks for Cedric. The spectre from the diary had sneered at her too, only a little older than she was now, and ugly with hate. But Tom had her blood in him now, blood of the enemy, her mother's love. He could touch her and he did one cold finger to her cheek. She remembered Professor Sprout leaving dirt on her cheek with a friendly warmth, remembered Molly Weasley scrubbing dirt off her face with a brisk absent-mindedness, like she was one of Molly's own. She wrenched her head away from his grasp. Tom Riddle thought he had chosen an equal. When their curses met midair, the world shook. The light grew. The ghosts came. Their deaths ripped out of Voldemort's wand. Maybe not ghosts, then. Memories. Things carried, dead things carried with you, like a shell, like a home that grew and grew with you. Harry brought Cedric's body back to Hogwarts, because he had asked her to. She didn't see Amos Diggory fall to his knees. She didn't feel Moody take her away, or hear Ginny shout her name. When the teachers came for Moody, 
for Barty Jr. She noticed. She noticed, but only barely. She got back to her bed in the dormitory, somehow. She went to sleep. She went back to Four Privet Drive. It was weeks into summer before she woke up enough to cry herself back to sleep. This has been a reading of a fan fiction creation by E.J. Lomax with music by Maiden. Thank you.